There we are. Great. Yeah. Hopefully, Fantastic. Hopefully the next slide. So um, you've got this here, and you just go that like that, and then yeah, back. Yeah, um, as James has already introduced himself, I won't bother introducing <laughs> him anymore. I'll just say, ladies and gentlemen, James Irvine. Thank you. So as I said, a bit of, bit of background on, on surname projects, YDNA. Um, a little bit about my project, just background, I'm not going to go into detail. And then the three main points I want to take up, going right back to the beginning, um, SDR results tables, I think that's some ground that needs going over again. Matching and grouping, very basic, but I've got some very fresh ideas on this, uh, perhaps controversial. And I want to go into TMRCAs, the dating of DNA data, which has always been something nice to have, um, but I've done some more work on it, and that I hope we will find interesting as well. So let's crack on. Basically, YDNA is about the male inheritance, like the surnames. Um, this is very basic, but the males only get it. Uh, females can, can get a father, so, son or uncle to chip in. Um, we get mutations, that happen slowly. And surnames change as well. A lot of parallels, the spelling changes. Uh, but occasionally, you can get a radical change in NPE, which has been introduced already. Um, as genealogists, and most of us are were originally and, and still are, we don't have the biologists here at this sort of a meeting, we want to get the DNA into a family tree. And this is the sort of family tree we're looking at. Mike Walsh developed this right the way back to Adam. Um, and it comes down very higgledy-piggledy. And the SNPs and the SDRs on the left um, help us do it. SDRs are more useful fairly recently. SNPs are a bit older. But in fact, they completely overlap. And you can put dates to them. At the end, I'll, I'll come back to the dating business. Um, there's all sorts of things you can use YDNA for, including deep ancestry, which I discount. I'm not looking at that. But the three points that I want to pick out today are this business of matching, how we identify genetic branches, and how we date these branches. So the other aspects I'm not going to be addressing. Um, a little bit about my project. It's, it's a Scottish name, but it appears in England, Ireland, and in America. Um, as I said, uh, we go back to 2005. We've got nearly 500 members now, which is medium-sized. Um, it's got a strong US bias because we have a clan association there. So 80-odd percent of the data is American, but it comes back to Ireland and to Scotland, as I'll show. 92%, um, in fact, of, of, the, of the ancestry of, of, the, of the study come back to... Uh, the British Isles. We were brought up in the family in the, of the surname. If you meet any Irvin, he will tell you that he was brought up. We all have a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. DNA has shown that to be complete rubbish, and this isn't unique to us by any means. We actually have about 40 branches, all quite unrelated to each other within the surname era. Mm -hmm. Each has its own story to tell. Uh, but we've, you, almost uniquely, one of our branches is two thirds of the total project. It is huge. It's the biggest, I think, of any surname project in the world. The candles are slightly bigger, but they include in that a much older grouping, so it's much more amorphous. The, this L55 branch is specific to the surname. Almost. I find one exception, but it's virtually specific. And we're well now into big Y and snip pack tests, identifying sub-branches. We've got nearly 100, either big Y or pack tests, which gives us a lot more confidence in, in what we're doing. And I've even been able to, as I explained this time last year, integrate the DNA into the, the conventional genealogy. We've got an overlap for a couple of families. Thought it was going to be a big breakthrough. We've only now, a year later, we're still struggling to get a third. But it can be done if you've got decent genealogies. Right, now the first thing I want to get rid of, and this is not peculiar to us, the, surname, the spelling is misleading. It's not completely irrelevant, but it's misleading. You can see in our project on the right the percentages of the different spellings, and if you look at the world population data, there's a very good correlation. So the study is, is picking up what the real world has. Um, it can be spelled all sorts of ways. Geographically and historically, there were some focuses on the spelling, but now it's all got mixed up. And indeed, I found in Aberdeenshire, for example, there's a branch that's traditionally spelled with an E, some of the people from the Scottish borders, where it's spelled with a G, have moved up there and they changed the spelling, and that's in the last century. People tend to spell as the native spell the name rather than the ancestors spell the name. Um, very clear evidence on that. Um, you can play this game. I've picked out one here. 
this one shows very clearly where most of the Irvings came from. It's very clearly a border, Scottish borders family. Orkney, Orkney and Shetland also register quite strongly. I happen to be of the Orkney branch, but I'll be speaking today about the borders, which is the, the main group. And in Ireland, a different kind of map, more up to date. Um, you can see the scattering, very much a Scots Irish <coughs> name, but a significant number in the south, and I'll pick that up in a minute. Uh, the Dublin grouping is, is typical of wherever there's an urban place, people might tend to migrate in the 19th century to get work. So you see a bit, bit around Dublin um, for manor shows as well, but Tipperary is, is coming up fairly strongly, I'll come back to that. Um, for those maps I showed were the whole population. For our project, I plotted where the earliest known paternal ancestors were for uh, about a third of the project. Um, they can identify this, mostly Americans, and you'll see the distribution is very similar to the population map. The surname possibly comes from the town of Irvine up in Ayrshire. Oops. Oops, on the wrong way. No, wrong, wrong way. There we are. Irvin up there in Ayrshire. Um, the chief of the Borders branch, the Tower, Onshore Tower, and in the plantation period, the relatively affluent Irvins migrated to Castle Irvin, um, but the vast majority, of course, were far less affluent and they were scattered all over the north, um, as, as one would expect. Now, one of the things that's come out of the study is very interesting. 76% of our study, nearly 500 members of the study, 76% of them live in the USA. 38% of them say they think they had Irish ancestry, that's as far back as they can get. But the study shows that 86% actually came from Scotland. Um, so quite an interesting picture there going back in time. <coughs> Uh, the project has grown steadily over the years. I used to wonder why. I think I now know why, and I'll come to it in a few minutes. Um, you'll see along the bottom, the green line is the number of branches we have of the surname. It started off just zero, because I wasn't able to split them up into branches. And then, as I've got more members um, along here, you can see the number of branches increasing fairly steeply, and then it flattens out, still growing slightly. And the number of people I can't put into branches started off at 50%. You see the brown line is half the blue line, and now it's less than 10%. So nearly everybody I can put into a branch. And most of the branches I can identify where they came from geographically. So this is the statistics of the, the SDR work. 40-odd um, branches. One of them is two-thirds. And we are very lucky to identify fairly on a very specific SNP fairly young snip, about the age of our surname, that characterizes these, these um, border Owens. We have a lot of NPEs, um, 19 groups in fact, you see that, whoops, sorry about this, get these things right, 19, there are 19 different branches, nearly half of the branches are border branches, but they're of other surnames, the, the DNA is other neighboring surnames, Bells, Armstrongs, Grahams, Obviously, border surnames. Obviously, something was happening in the 14th, 15th centuries, and there's a large number of groups, but but not of people. And then Aberdeenshire, I mentioned, Forthshire, Orkney, Shetland, Ireland. This is very interesting. Two branches. Now, these ones are, even though they've got the Scottish surname, they're Irwins, <coughs> or however they spell it, um, but they're very clearly nothing to do with Scots Irish. They're Catholic. In living memory, they spoke Gaelic. They know the old Gaelic surname, and they all came from a particular bit of Tipperary. So what had happened was the Gaelic name had become anglicized, maybe as long ago as the 16th century. So they fit into our project, but they're not Scots-Irish at all. And of course, as you can imagine, get quite upset when I tend to label them as such in a general way. And the African one is very interesting. This is only a 12 marker one, single test. Came in, and he was this E group, E. Uh, here we are, E, we get it there, E, completely different from everything else. Af uh, a, a, a African, and I thought this is a bit funny, what's going on? And he said, oh, well, we're very proud, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an African, an Afro-American, I'm black. Um, my great-grandfather was liberated as a slave in, in 1865, emancipated, um, but I don't know how he got his surname. And I was able to say, well, probably the, the owner of the plantation was the Scots-Irish who migrated to Carolina, Florida 
in the uh, 18th century, and you probably got your surname from, from him. So he was thrilled with that, and I was thrilled to show that our surname actually has that social spectrum right from right-wing Americans, I don't know whether there are any present, um, tea lady, blue rinse, Republican, all the rest of it, right through to the other end of the spectrum. So we're, we're broad church, which is what I'm proud of. Now, going on a bit to the, hap the, the snips and the haplo trees, um, uh, Alistair showed a bit of this. This is Mike Walsh's picture of R1B, and you'll see we are in. Here's, whoops. Here's us down bottom, bottom right, the border Owens. We're L55, literally at the bottom. It's near the Royal Stuarts that was mentioned, uh, but we're quite young, so we're at the bottom. Why we're out in the limb, I don't know. We've Johnny come late there, something like that. We're quite small, nothing like these big ones, but we figure on, on that map. Um, here's Alex Williamson's big tree. There's L555 up there. You'll see it's in a huge block. So that, whilst the bottom of that block is about 1,000 years old, the top of the block is probably about 3,000 years old. Eventually, when enough people test, that block will break up and we'll be able to split it, possibly. Um, but of our bit, there's only one in this, according to Alex Williamson, this is not up to date, there's only two, two branches. Those are all Irvins and these are all Irvins, apart from some MPEs. Um, I'll show you in a minute that I've got a lot more detail on that. So that puts us on that map. This is the way FTA, FTDNA do it now. FTDNA, when they first brought out Big Y, the haplo tree was way behind. Now I believe it's better than Alex Williamson's. Alex Williams' work is more of a higher quality, it's got more potential, but at present the best haplo tree, as far as I'm concerned, the most detailed one, is the FTDNA one. And, oh dear, sorry. Uh, there's L555, and you see they split it up into an awful lot. And when it says more, that's all those ones that were in that big block that Alex Williams <coughs> showed, and if you click on more, you get all the other ones. Um, so you'll see there's a lot of detail there. Now, I believe in, this is one of the things I want to get over today, do your own haplot tree, <coughs> because most of us are pretty introverted, egocentric, we're looking at our surname. So this is the haplot tree, going back to Adam, of our surname, and you'll see, there's the African one I was talking about, there's one of the, the Gaelic Irish ones. <laughs> these are little codes I have, these two letter things. Um, and right down here at the border of in CL555, the other Irish one is, is down there, I for I, Ireland, M for Munster, I for Ireland, L for Leinster, that's the way I've done a sort of coding. The brown area is the bit that Alex Williamson does, and the, aster the hatches signs are where you can get a pack test, which is a cheap way of getting your SNPs. You won't find any new SNPs, but if they exist and your pack test is designed well, you can get onto this tree fairly quickly. But I recommend that everybody, be they a project leader or just a member of a surname group, make their own haplotree tree of their surname so you can see how closely the branches connect. Because we're all related back to Adam. But the surname era starts away down here at the bottom, roughly. So anything above the bottom line is, is, is before surname. So the surname bit is very recent. Now, if we, I want to go on to the next bit. The next tree sort of takes the L55 bit and expands it. And look what we've got. There's L55 up there with its earlier ones I've just put in or on the other tree. And then you see we've got one, two, three, four, five, I count six, six levels, and we've got 43 subgroups. Um, all the ones in boxes are big Y. The ones in green down here are the kit numbers that have done pack tests, and I've been able to tag on a few family finder and conventional genealogy ones at the bottom. Um, so there's about 100 kits on that. About a third of my project I can get onto this one haplot tree. Um, there's only one or two I can connect up with conventional genealogy, the Bonshaw one there, the Castle Irving one I've got, and there's one coming. Um, but that's a family tree but without names. But that's all Irvins, except for this one at the extreme end is a Wilson. So I think we now have to recognize that L555 is not surname specific, it's the next one down that is surname specific. Uh, that one is just at the beginning where the Wilsons, some Wilsons split off. So that in itself is an interesting discovery. Okay, that's the background. Now the first point I want to make is this business about results tables. 
and it's got it's changed a bit in the last year in fact we've lost the world families tables which were very interesting very nice and we now FTDNA do four different results tables I'm going to show you three of them um, it depends whether it's classic or colorized and whether the opt-in uh, version of or the not opt-in version is, is uh, what you're looking at. Here's the classic one without the colorization, um, and you'll see that it's got two groups. Um, that's the Aberdeenshire branch, and then they go into the Borders branch. So this is the beginning of 300 people that belong in that branch, and there they are listed out. This is the way FTDNA do it. Now, you can get the colorized version, which FTDNA do, and you'll see the, these colored bits here are where the, the, the mode is shown um, for each group and then differences from the mode are picked out in colour. That's very useful but it's very limited because they've only used two colours. Blue is, is less than the modal value for each marker and pink is more than the modal value. So the modal value there is 29 and that in pink is 30. And you'll notice down here the three with that marker there. When I go on to this one there's four. Now this is the private version and the previous one was the public version. You only get the private version now if you're signed in. You don't know, looking at the screen, you're looking at a different version, but if you're logged in as a, on your personal page with FTDNA, this is what you'll see. Uh, I shouldn't show that one because it's a private one, but in fact I can show it because he's since signed in, so he's now public, so I can show you um, that he's, of the other one, it's out of date, that's why I can show you. But you'll see it's still, the colorized is still only two, two, two colors, and all you've got is your STR markers. Now this is my own private project website, which is on the web, um, and this is the borders group at the top, um, and the first page, top left, there's, there's 250 columns in this, in this um, website, on this street and it's 500 long so I've got 500 members so I have to show it bit by bit. But I've been able to put in the, hap oh, put in the haplotree. tree, see there's the haplotree, tree, very much as per FTDNA. I've got a column here for family finder results, um, I've got more genealogical data here, which tests they took, how many markers they tested and all this sort of thing. And that's just for the first 30 and just top left. Top center is what is more familiar. Um, you'll see here are, the, here are the 1 to 67 markers going on, top right is for the 111 markers. Um, I use a more sophisticated colouring thing so that if it's one more it's, it's a sort of yellowy colour, a brown colour, red, if it's three more there's no reds there, um, and similarly if it's less. Um, and I've been able to identify blocks because these are all, if you remember on the left hand side, in the haplotree, tree, so they're all closely related. Uh, and you'll see some significant SDRs coming out as a theme. There is a, a line there showing that that one was private, so I can't show it to you. I've uh, got 96% of my project are now showing in public. There's only 18 left out of 500 that aren't showing uh, on the public website. And I haven't had a single one who said he doesn't want to. It's just that some have been defaulted out, and I haven't got them back in yet. And then in the middle of the thing is a more familiar picture, but you'll see the, the different branches, the smaller branches, there's the Aberdeenshire one. The colour here is different from the modal of the whole project, in other words, effectively the borders one, and you'll see how the, each project has got blocks that are quite unique to that, um, that particular branch, um, but quite separate to the others. There, for example, is somebody that's private, I've had to erase it from the screen. So I can't show his results in public, um, and I consider this a public forum. Well, it'll go on the web. That's why I have to do. It. Um, there's one, oops, one null value there, some reds, or quite a few reds. But you can see the amount of extra detail. I've got the different Atlantic, West Atlantic, and L21, and the rare markers up at the top, and the mutation rates. You can put in all sorts of detail. Now, what I want to do is go over the pros and cons of doing these do-it-yourself Excel sheets. There's some very significant disadvantages. It's very labor-intensive. That's been built up over 15 years. It doesn't happen overnight. It's huge. It's less up-to-date. Obviously, each time somebody 
gives a new test result, I'm not necessarily catching that and putting it up to date. In fact, I update it in public every six months because it's now fairly stable. And I have to be very, very careful not to have transcription errors or to breach privacy, which is now quite sensitive. But the advantages are, are to me colossal. And you, the point I want to get over, you don't have to be a project administrator to do this, you can do it yourself. Um, you can add in the, the results of the of the panels above 111 markers. You can put in SNP and Big Y data, Family Finder. Non-FTDNA results can go in. Um, I can put in the modal gen genetic distances, genealogical data. The, group, the groups don't have to be in alph alphabetical order anymore. Within the groups, I can put them in the order I want rather than the order that FTA DNA gives us. There's flexibility in all of us. Much better insight, and it's a much better advertisement for the project, which I think is why we have grown the way we have. I could never understand why we grew because I don't market or anything like that. It's just on the web and I think people like what they see. And the bulk of what's good about our website is that it's got all this extra data on it on one, on one uh, spreadsheet. But the do-it-yourself table is a supplement to the FDDNA rather than a uh, substitute. That's important. Now the next thing I want to go on to is matching and grouping. And we, Talked about this, several of us at different different presentations over the years. Um, I want to go over it again because I, I wasn't happy that I, I understood it myself. There's no better way of learning a subject than lecturing on it. <laughs> Preparing this lecture sort of rubbed it in. Matching is answering the question of whether two results match. It's answering a question. Grouping is putting several together. So they're very similar processes, but actually there's, there's some significant differences. Um, we use the tool primarily genetic distance. For those of you not familiar, this is how you do it. Uh, there are four different kinds of genetic distance, which is pretty academic, stepwise, infinite allels, but it's not completely irrelevant. Um, the special rules are some of the markers. These, um, these, these ones here, A and B, they have to treat them a bit differently, and one and two you have to treat a bit differently. Um, and all these genetic distances don't take account of the fact that the, the different markers mutate it very different rates, a factor of 400 between the slowest and the fastest, and yet with genetic distance they all get given the same weight. So you're looking at a very crude measure, but still, it's, it's useful. Now for the FTDNA matches pages, um, there's a matches page, I'll come back to that. Um, they assume 15 generations. Well, that's, that's all right. Um, there was Morris and, and Alistair would point out, and several others, Quite a few of our surnames go back further than that, and it's relevant. They assume a hybrid definition of genetic distance. Well, that's all right. It's not a big issue. But they ignore the surname evidence. Um, so anything that's got it in for 37 markers, which I'll talk about, less than, th less than the genetic distance of four, it's in as a match. Now, that is rubbish, because some of the ones with dissimilar surnames are NPEs, and most of the ones with dissimilar surnames will be false positives caused by convergence. And also, um, there's a rule, the 10% rule, this 4 by 37 is an arbitrary cutoff, and there are a lot, as I'll show, that um, are excluded by this crude tool. It's a useful, rough and ready start, but I'll show you, I'll go through each of these points in a bit more detail to show why the matches pages are a good start, but they are very limited in uh, what they try to do. First of all, MPEs, I also touched on this. They're caused by remarriages. To me, that's the most frequent cause of an NPE. Um, a woman remarries, and her son, by our first marriage, takes the name of his stepfather. Quite innocent, nothing immoral about it. Um, and that's why I think a lot of the NPEs happen. There can be more sinister reasons and more interesting reasons. Historically, NPEs are said to be 1 or 2% per generation. But if you're looking at a surname that's 24 generations old, and it was having 2% per generation, that's 50% of us are MPEs. And if you think today, 50% of the population is getting a surname different to their father, compared to 2% historically, the MPEs are going to get vastly outnumber the others. But that's a problem for the future, I hope. And you can get two types. You can have the surname, surname A, but the DNA of surname B, or you can be surname B, but have the DNA of surname A. Quite confusing this, and you have to be careful how you handle it. So that's the theory of NPEs. Um, now, when you look at the matches page, 
you can get NPEs and false positives uh, and true matches. So this is an Elliot. Uh, um, there's an Elliot that has got rid of his Christian name for privacy reasons. And you'd expect all these matches to be Elliots. Well, you see the ones in green, four of them are Elliots. But then we've got one, two, three, four, five Irwins, they're NPEs. And then you've got the blue ones, MacDonald, Armstrong, and Snowden, and they're false positives. Now, the proportion of those three groups will vary from person to person. Some of them will be all green, they'll all be true matches. Some will be only one surname, your surname, and the others are all mixed up, so they're mostly false positives. It's very difficult to tell. The only, two, the only way you can really tell is by looking at the haplogroup that will, uh, with a SNP test. But you'll see even here, oops, um, they do list the haplogroup, FTDNA, but they, they, they're fairly old ones, so you'll see the P312 is not helping sort out the wheat from the chaff. You've got to get a fairly young uh, SNP to help sort out this ambiguity. And then convergence. This is a very simple illustration of convergence. I'm assuming, very arbitrarily, a single mutation every five generations. So after five generations, there can be three different readings, no mutation, plus one or minus one. And then another five generations, you can have uh, five different answers, but two of them, so two of them, the two that are dashed, that one and that one, they've come back to where it started. So you think the history is the straight line, but it might be that line or it might be that line. And that's what convergence is and why we get mixed up. We find people with the same surname, we've got identical SDR counts, but in fact we've got a very different history over time. It's just that we can't see the history. And in that particular example, you've got a 22% probability of convergence happening. As I say, it can be even more than that. Very confusing, very difficult to understand. Ten years ago, none of us in this room knew what convergence was. I think I can say that safely. And now we're, we're beginning to realize that it's, it's, the, it's the elephant in the room, so far as STRs are concerned. Now, this is a very interesting bit. I've taken 20 of my L55 Irwins and compared them. Now, you can compare them two ways. You can compare them with the mode, and it so happens that the mode is this, this fellow here, N126337. He happens to be the mode. And you'll see, if you can make it out, that his GDs, with one exception, the five are less than four. So he fits nicely, that one's a bit freakish. Uh, but when you do the matrix, you'll find that there's a lot more, a lot that exceed four. I've put them in black, there are a lot of sixes there. And look at this line, five, five, six, eight, nine. Um, none of them are below four. So you think he definitely isn't a match. If you look at the matches page, he doesn't appear. And when you do this work, he's way over five, even away up here. And yet he is deeply embedded, it's not just Fringe L55 is right in the middle of, of this. So he is a bona fide, real dinky die Owen, but very different from his okay. SDRs, because SDRs occur randomly, and this crude match of four doesn't necessarily pick it, pick it up. So what I did, that was just an example of 20. Um, I've got 91 bona fide L55 Owens, taking away the, the NPEs, so there's no gray area. And that means that if you multiply 90 by 90, you get about 8,000. So a huge matrix of 8,000, and I've done the statistics from them. If you do the mod kit to modal genetic distances, it's in green. And you see most of them are within four, but there are a couple that's a five and a six. But if you do the kit to kit ones, that's the whole matrix, um, you'll see that a significant number are beyond the four. And unless you look at the surname group and start playing with it, you won't pick up those matches. They're real matches, but they're not being picked up on the matches page. So when you find that A matches B and B matches C, but C doesn't match A, this may be the reason why, because it's, it's outside the, outside the uh, threshold of four. So what do we get out of this? It's a bit complicated. There, there is, the, first of all, kit to kit, which if you're doing matching is what you want to look at. Um, you'll see the biggest... Um, spread I got was 6 by 37 of the, uh, for the, sorry, modal, yes, 637, 9% were more than 4 by 37. Um, now, Morris Gleason gave me his data for, for the, his Gleason's which are slightly older, and he actually gets up to 8 by 37, so we're not, not the worst. If you, I think if you have a younger surname, 
this problem is less, but if it's a very old surname, uh, this problem is more acute. And then if you look at the matrix, um, Morris gets up to 11 by 37. I've actually found 13 by 37 true matches. Um, and 18% uh, or 9% for me, 27% are over the four. And when we come to TMRCAs, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, this is what you want to look at. Um, the, the modal comparisons are useful for grouping, but it's the kit-to-kit -kit ones you need to use for your TMRCAs. Sorry it's so complicated, but it'll be on the web and you can digest it. Right, now, another way of doing grouping is, rather than looking at your, just your DDs, this fellow, Chase Ashley, has just come out a year or so ago with a, an app. It's surprisingly easy to use. Very, very easy to use. You can run through three or four of them in literally five minutes. Well, about one, it takes about a minute to do what I'm doing now once you get the hang of it. Very simple. You just copy the public page of your surname, uh, plug it into his app, and you get, you get something like this. Now, what he's done, the second column I want you to look at, um, those are his groupings. Now, the brown lines are what I've done myself historically, deciding there's the Irish Leinster group, the Irish Munster group, and the uh, Netherlands group. Uh, I'll go into detail on that. And then there's an ungrouped one. So you'll see in my ungrouped ones, where I couldn't group them, he struggled as well. But for my Netherlands one, my diagnosis of what belongs and what doesn't belong is exactly the same as his. For my Linster ones, exactly the same. For the Munster ones, exactly the same. So the way I'm grouping is the way that he groups. Now, I'm not saying that he's right and I'm right, because there are other ways of doing it, but the way I do it happens to be the way that he does it. And I think most people would roughly find that. Now, what I've then done is look at about 20 other projects to see how consistent that is. Now, we're, there are the Irwins about a um, third of the way down. The top is the listed in size, of, in size of project. So the Browns, very common surname, they've got 1,200, right down to the Austins who've only got 38. This is a random selection. If you're not, if your surname isn't here, uh, don't worry. There's Burn. Oh, we've got some Burns in the audience, just above the Irwins. And what I've done is there's the size of the, of the project, um, the number of groups that are, I've identified, you see I identified, four, well it's there 40, I got 41 on another slide, but about that. Ashley identified 44, so the ratio of 40 to 44 is 0.9. So if you're above one, you're doing it about the same way, but the ones highlighted are obviously doing it differently. Now Davis and Miller, they're getting far fewer ones themselves than Ashley did, so that's a fairly superficial grouping that they're doing, and when it's a red one, Byrne, is doing, he's found 81, whereas Ashley only found 44, so he's doing it much, in much more detail. Uh, there's nothing right or wrong about that. He may have some good evidence, um, but it's just an interesting variation. And you'll see some elsewhere that may raise some eyebrows, but I won't go into that. Um, the largest group, you see we, we've got this huge one here of 286, a third of our, two thirds of my project in one group, and that, if you could read it, would be 60% and it's easily the highest. And this is why I'm worried about, are we a freak? Is there something funny about us? Um, but you'll see there's some others up over 50, so we're not way off. And there's some that are very low. And I've had a look to see if that's due to founder effect. Uh, it wasn't, didn't, there was no correlation with founder effect at all, even though I expected there would be. It seems <coughs> to be a Scottish and Irish thing, but I wouldn't like to hang my hat on that. And then I did another thing, comparing the number of groups that Ashley found to the number of kits, and there's a bit more correlation here. We come out at 9%. We are a plural name, P for plural, and the red ones, which are much higher, seem to be with the multiple names, and we've got one single name source, single source surname down here, which is lower. So there's some correlation between size of group and type of surname. This is all done last week, and I don't ask you to, 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 uh, to hang your hat on it. I certainly don't, but it's way, with this, tool now, we can compare projects on a like-for-like -like basis. I think there's lots of potential here to, to, uh, to explore all sorts of possibilities. So here are the different ways that different, different people do matches. Um, 37 markers, there's FTDA cutting off at four. They have another one that's a bit woolly. There's Ashley and here's mine. 
and I'd take it up to seven. Um, now, this is a, a slide that I borrowed from Morris. Really, when you're doing grouping, you've got to think much wider than just genetic distance. There are all sorts of other factors. Some have nothing to do with, with DNA at all, surname features and, and most distant ancestor. Some you can get from SDR data, and there used to be people who thought that rare markers were very significant. I, I discount that. I used to be keen on TIP, and that's got debased because they fiddled with it. There's Ashley's group. Ashley is a grouping app, which is easy to use, but it's not infallible. The Hapler group is the one that is good, but it's got to be fairly mid-level. And really, to be absolutely sure, you've got to get into big Y and uh, pack tests and, or SNP tests. So it's a, it, grouping is iterative and it's subjective. We can quantify it much better than we used to be able to, but it still needs a bit of, a bit of art as opposed to science. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to get over. And I, I think we've, a, lot of, a lot more work can be done on this. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is TMRCAs, tied to the most recent ancestor. And you can do this for two individuals, which is the way most of us have done it. You find two kits. You find the genetic distance. I'll go through it. And you can find out when tying back to the common ancestor. Um, or you can do it for a branch, and that's more complicated, but that's what we need because the branch is going to give you a much better picture than just two individuals. And there's three tools we can use, documentary evidence, um, the SDR estimates, and the SNPs. And if you want a bit more background, um, a fellow called Ian MacDonald has done a very good web page. It's just about intelligible for the layman. He's, he's, he's an academic, and he's got all the statistics up his sleeve, and there's a lot of that, but you can just about understand it, which is refreshing for for some cases, and I'm going to use, again, our project to illustrate some of the points. So the documentary evidence for the border urbans, we've got one pedigree that we can back, take back to 1500, quite good, but we've got other, other branches of the family I can take back further. Uh, but uh, certainly in 1500, there were several well-established branches, so we know the common ancestor was, was before that. We've got odd references in the century, previous century of, of uh, Irwin's living there. And the earliest goes back to 1376. That's the earliest record we've got, reliable evidence we've got. At 1296, Scotland had the Ragman Roll, which isn't an exclusive list of every surname in Scotland, but it's not far off it. And there are no Irwins there. So probably the hereditary surname was not being used in 1296, at least by anybody who owned land. Um, we can go back another century where there are many Irwins in Scotland, but they went in Belfrisia. So at a guess, Probably the ancestor of the Dunfrisha Irvins was born between 1250 and 1350. There's no science in that, it's sort of gut feel, but this is how you can use documentary evidence to get a ballpark figure of where the DNA should be pointing. Now, if you use SDRs, you've got to look at the number of kits you're comparing. It can be two, it can be several. The number of markers and how the mismatches are counted, I think that's more important than I had appreciated. The number of mismatches, the average mutation rate, and the average years per generation. All those are unknown variables, so any answer you get out is dependent on the decision you've made on that input data. Um, the average mutation rate, there's three that are in the literature to use. McGee was 0.0024, most of 0.0033. And Doug McDonald, I'll show you his method, he's now recommending 0.42. You see there's nearly a factor of two. And this is through lack of research. It's not one's right, one's wrong. Just the research is not as good as it might be. And the number of years per generation, I'll show you why we need that. But that can vary between 20 and 40, typically 3 to 35. Ian McDonald's 35 is about what I feel is about right. Um, so when you plug that all together, you go through the, or you go through the process, this is Doug McDonald's tool. Um, you plug in the number of markers you want, the number of mismatching markers, and he's using infinite allels, which is not the same way as GD count them, uh, the same way as um, FTDNA count them. The difference isn't, isn't big, but it, it could be significant. And you plug in whatever mutation rate you want, and you get out this graph, and you'll see the mode. The most common is about 12 generations. And if you take the 95% limits, that's 0.025 either side, something between 5 and 20 odd generations. So if, you, if you're looking at a mismatch of 4 at 37 markers and that mutation rate, that's the answer you get, 12. Now here are four different 
approaches it to four different applications. And the first one, I've assumed 37 markers, 0.0042, 30 years per generation, four by 37. The mode, um, the most common is 1590, and it can be between 10,000. If you go up to point, down to, down to 0.33, you'll see it's moved by 180 years. Um, and if you go to 111 markers, which should be better, um, you get 1530 and 1460. Now those tables apply to anybody. The only bits in, the bits in green are the ones specific to me, but you, the, the, that data you can use for any surname and you don't even have to look at them. If my maths is right, that's what you want to use. Um, please check it and if I find I'm wrong, I'd be delighted to know. Um, so you don't need to go through the laborious process. That gives you all the answers you want. But you'll see for all of them, there's a huge, the 95% limit is a, a very wide spread. Um, I haven't, when it's earlier than the surname, I've just stopped at 10,000 arbitrarily. No, that's one way of doing it. We can also do it with SNPs. And the way to do it with SNPs is very easy. You take the number of SNPs within a group that aren't shared by everybody, that's the number of private SNPs, divided by the number of people that are sharing that SNP and multiplied by the average number of years per SNP. You don't need a graph and all the rest of it, you can do it yourself. Um, the less kits or, and groups you have, the more unreliable it's going to be because we're looking at a statistical process, so you want a, a big database. Two methods, YFO and Ian McDonald. Um, why full, and my thanks to, to John Cleary for this, um, took me a bit of time to work this out, but they work in the years before present, and they assume that the tester was born in 1960. Ian MacDonald works in absolute years, but if you want it years before present, he went back to 1950. So one or other, you have to add or subtract 60 or 70 to get a comparison. Why full imply they use 144 years, but in fact, if you look at it, they, they, they jiggle around with it, and as I'll show you, for, for us, they're using 156. Ian MacDonald recommends 125, but small print up to 197, depending on the quality of the test. Now, this is beyond me. It's very important. I'm not dismissing it, but we're getting into a very gray area here where even the experts aren't, aren't sure. But still, you can do the maths. Here's, here's um, what you get when you go to IFOL. Um, they, they, it's all there and you can decode it. Um, there's the uh, 700, looking for 850. There's 850 down the bottom. Uh, 850 you get out of it. Um, so if you go to Eiffel, they did five kits of 158 years. If you did one of them, you get 1330. And if you use the five, five kits they looked at, which is quite a small sample, there's not many people in our project have gone to Eiffel. Other people, all the people have gone to Eiffel, which makes the prediction more accurate, but they come up with 1170. If you do it by Ian McDonald's method, he's giving you slightly different things, and you come up with 1310 um, with, with the haplogroup group uh, 19, the old big Y. With the new big Y, I've gone up from five SNPs to seven SNPs under L55 as an average, but I believe that Ian McDonald hasn't yet gotten years per generation for. HG38, so I'm saying results not available, because by definition, if I multiply something by 7, I should be getting a, a similar answer, and if I multiply something else by 5, they should come out similar. I, I don't know the answer for that yet, but I don't think Ian's done the work on it. So, last slide of substance, um, documentary sources, 1250 to 1350, um, 37 markers, SDRs, 1410, 111 markers, 14, 1460, and two different SNP ones. So they're all in the same ballpark, and you can start fiddling it and kid yourself. If I disregard this one and tweak that one, you can get them all to equal each other. But who are you kidding? There's so many uncertainties that we know it's roughly in that ballpark. So I know that my surname is not as old as Morris's surname, but it's younger than somebody else's surname. It's that order of magnitude. So please don't hang your hat on the fact that you can work it out I mean, I've rounded them there for the nearest 10 years, but it should be rounded for the nearest 50 years or the nearest 100 years. Um, so that's it. Um, what I've tried to get over today is that large surname projects can offer insights that you can't get with small surname projects. 
SNPs, as everyone else has said, offer much more potential, but of course it costs more money. Develop your own spreadsheets, both for SDR results and haplotrees. When you're grouping, do remember that 4 by 37 or 6 by 67 is a very arbitrary limit, and it includes some rubbish, and it excludes some good stuff. Um, and uh, when you're doing TMRCAs, just be careful. It needs a large pinch of salt. Thank you very much, particularly my friend. Thanks very much, James. Um, now, obviously, all of this DNA work that you're doing is uh, being used in conjunction with a lot of the documentary evidence. So where did you get your documentary evidence for the Irwins? Well, I started 60 years ago. Um, and uh, in 2005, this American said he was going to do it all by DNA. I could chuck all my documentary evidence out the window. And I said, not in my Nelly are you going to tell me how I'm going to ditch all the documentary work. It's hard slog. The Public Records Office in Edinburgh, just like the Public Records Office here, has got a lot. Family archives, we're very lucky. Uh, Bonshaw has got quite a bit of material. A drum has got 20,000 documents, which I've helped index, <laughs> the actual raw data. Um, up in Orkney, um, I've looked at every urban reference there is, and I couldn't do a one-name study on the Orkney urbans. There's too many of them. Uh, it's just hard work, and, and it's what we all do. But I enjoy doing the elder stuff. I'm not awfully interested in finding my third cousin. I'm much more interested in finding what happened in 1460. But it's just many years of hard great. work. Um, the reason I ask is because I, like, I guess a lot of the people in the audience will be doing or interested in doing their own uh, surname uh, study. So that means going to the repositories, the archives, the libraries, and looking at the old documents for that particular surname of interest. But is there anything online, for example? Do you know of any good online sources where people could at least start the study from the comfort of their own home? I know lots of Irving online sources that are all, I wouldn't even say tertiary, the four layers of, of iteration, and they've taken books and so forth. Some, good, some very good books published, I could rattle them off. Some very good books have been written on the family. But they're, they're detailed and they're, they're dated and they're you know, they've been done best of intentions. And I'm writing a book on it all now, and I know in 50 years' time, people are going to say, well, you know, he thought he knew everything, but, but we now know much more than he ever knew. Well, that's the way of life. Um, but when you go onto the web and you look up Irwin family history, you'll find gushing things about Robert the Bruce and his armor bearer and all the rest of it. I mean, it's gospel. But it's not quite the same as that one. It's not quite the same as that one. And when you look at the original material, which I found here in the Public Record Office in Belfast, has got more on the Irvings of Scotland than you find in Edinburgh, and I found the 1680 document, it was just like a web, you know, a tertiary web fellow today. He was writing down what he'd been told. It was a lovely flowery story, and in those days they weren't too worried about accuracy. But because it's 1680, we all think it's gospel. It's crap, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when you get the DNA and it shows the drum and Bonshaw, which he said were all had the same ancestor, we now know the chalk and cheese. Not very romantic, and everybody was disappointed, including myself, but you know, you, the facts come out and you, you want to bury them, you do it at your peril. <laughs> but I think most of us have been through this sort of thing in their own family history one way or another. Oh yes, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> um, questions for James. How many people are actually doing a, their own surna a surname study? A few people, right? Okay. Um, Jeb, Debbie, you had a question. Is the, the Chase Ashley tool, does that take into account SNPs or is it purely SDRs? It's purely SDRs. Oh, right. And he does make some rather subjective assumptions. He talks about relative distance. And we all have our hobby horses. I used to be on about uh, tips and so forth. I don't really understand it. But to me, its value is that it's one uh, rigid formula that he uses. And whether it's accurate or not is less important than the fact that you can apply it to lots of different surnames and you can make a comparison on a like-for-like -like basis. Uh, I'm honestly not too worried about how accurate it is. It happens to come out about the right way. And perhaps more important, it's not that I'm right, but he's about in the middle of everybody else. So he's obviously hitting it about right. That's more important, the fact that I, he gets the same, roughly the same as me. Right. Uh, but it's very easy to use. I, I've used it a couple of times. But once you get in the hang of it, you can rattle through half a dozen surnames in, in five minutes. And uh, that's quite interesting. Great. Fantastic. Any other questions for James at all? 
Okay, well, it just remains for me to, to thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. You've done some great work. Thank you very much, James Irvin.